podcast has seen the horrors of living within a monetary system, both in the ancient and modern world, and is brave enough to be speaking out about it. Michael Tellinger is an author, researcher, and scientist, often considered a real-life Indiana Jones. His deep level of archaeological study has made him an authority on the origins of mankind. He's laid out this research in several books entitled Slave Species of the Gods, Adam's Calendar, and Temples of the African Gods, and I'm psyched as hell to have him here on the line all the way from South Africa. Michael, welcome to the show. Hi, you, Greg. Nice to be talking to you all the way in San Diego. <laughs> Absolutely, man. It's a real pleasure. I know we set this up kind of last minute because you're busy getting ready for a long U.S. lecture tour, and your work is so vast. We could talk about all sorts of things, but I'm hoping we can start by talking about the ancient world and how we became a slave species of the gods, as your book puts it, and then transition to the notion that uh, a notion that people are a little bit less comfortable with, and that's that we're still a slave species today. So, you know, with that... Let's shred up the conventional history. Can you give us some clues into the great human puzzle, a little overview into our origins, if you'd be so kind? Yeah, thanks very much, Greg, and thanks for that intro, because it's really important to, um, to bring together, as you, as you introduced it, the, the past and the present. And what is fascinating, I find, at some of the presentations I did in the USA last year, when I started pulling in the the current events of of today and the 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 complete and utter enslavement that we find ourselves in as a species today, um, towards the end of my presentation, some people got a little um, confused and then they approached me afterwards and say, "Why are you bringing politics into archaeology and origins of humankind? You know, why are you mixing the two? Right. And I was astounded to hear that because it's. What is really critical for us to realize is that we are a product of our past. And if we don't know who we are and where we come from, how could we possibly think we know where we are going? And that might not make sense to, be, to some people now, but believe me, by the time you've gone through this body of information, especially what I'm going to discuss with you today about the origins of humankind that we find here in South Africa and in Southern Africa, there can be no more guessing or doubt about that. We present physical and scientific evidence. You see that it's a continuum and a continuation for thousands and thousands of years of control and abuse of the human race that results in who we are and what's happening to our species today. And that's critical. So let's get back to um, your first question or what you started off with the origins of humankind in Southern Africa. Sure. You know, the, this is a fascinating subject. You know, I don't think there's anyone alive today that hasn't asked themselves the, the three the holy grail questions, I guess you can call them, what I call the great human puzzle. Who are we? Where do we come from? And why are we here? And the moment you ask those questions and you start scratching around and looking for answers and clues, very quickly you realize that that is a bottomless pit of layer upon layer of clues and disinformation and misinformation, and you've got to wade your way through these layers of very interesting research and stuff. And that's why it is a it is a field of research that so many people are attracted to. And I, I guess I was very fortunate to find myself here in South Africa, where many people for many decades have been saying that this is the cradle of humankind. And it's been interesting for the last um, several decades how the so-called cradle of humankind has shifted from sort of East Africa, uh, from the Tanzania, Kenyan uh, area where the, the Leakeys have been doing a lot of archaeological work and sharing their research on, on the, the early Australopithecian um, remains and so forth and reaching conclusions that humanity has evolved out of those kind of little cretins and so forth. But as, as more and more research has found its way into mainstream, you find this origins of humankind making its way further south and further south until it finally ended up here, in, right here in smack bang in South Africa, in which we now call the cradle of humankind and uh, one specific place, um, Static Fontaine Caves, which is just outside of Johannesburg. The only problem with the Stagfontein Caves, just like with all the other archaeological digs and these conclusions that they reach, um, in which they very strongly promote the sort of evolutionary process from ape to human, there are no evidential intermediary steps. 
there is no missing link, and that that never-ending quest for the missing link continues until you step outside of that box and you come to where I now am and find myself in the mountains of Mpumalanga and you start looking at the vanished civilizations or the mysterious stone circles of southern Africa. And suddenly, everything that you've read in all the books of Zachariah Sitchin that many people still are trying to, you know, prove to be false and, and so forth. And um, once you realize that we have, I've now presented the physical evidence of what Zachariah Sitchin has been writing about for 40 years, 50 years before he died, and the texts of the Sumerian uh, clay tablets and the translations that speak about the Abzu and the, the great gold mining empire of the Sumerian entity Enki, that established this vast gold mining empire in this place called Abzu, and you start connecting the dots, you realize that this is it. We have found, and I'll present the physical evidence of the Abzu, irrefutable evidence of gold mining, stone tools and artifacts that go back way over 200,000 years, and uh, I think we close the loop of any speculation or, or hesitation that this, is, this must be what the Sumerian tablets refer to as the, the gold mining empire of the so-called Anunnaki. And um, once you get into the Sumerian tablets, um, you realize that that's, that's really what they deal with. They deal with the Anuna gods, these beings that arrived from some distant planet. There's still much speculation as to what the planet was called. Some people call it Nibiru. Uh, Zachariah Sitchin calls it Nibiru and all his work. Um, the Anuna gods, the gods of heaven and earth, and therefore Sitchin calls them the Anunnaki, as in Un in heaven and Ki being earth. So the Anunnaki, the gods of heaven and earth, that came to earth looking for gold, and they found it in huge quantities right here in southern Africa. So um, yeah, that's that's really what what I present, and um, and uh, it just grows into a beautiful story the deeper you dig. Yeah, I mean, it is fascinating to think back. The first time I'd heard about this material, I started thinking about just our culture in general, uh, the worship of gold, which is just so odd. Uh, even in the ancient world, like everything being made of gold, and it, it goes today. Like everybody's talking about dumping your uh, U.S. currencies or your Western currencies to get into gold because gold is where the real value is. And it's really no different than another you know, element or another thing you would pull out of the ground. But maybe this um, this fascination with gold comes from an ancient teacher like the Anunnaki. Yeah, it's critical to to uh, to also draw a distinction between these Anunnaki or the the gods of ancient times and uh, all our ancient texts, which includes the Bible, the Quran, and all the the the, the Hebrew writings. Um, from the Mahabharata, the Vedas, and the, the Mayan texts, they all talk about the gods. All ancient cultures talk about our ancestry, the human ancestry coming from the stars, that our ancestors came from the stars, that the gods came down from the sky and created the humans. Now, ev every single ancient culture talks about that. We have somehow been taught, and slowly but surely over a few hundred years, been told that that's all a bunch of nonsense, and uh, that we know exactly how this this, um, this human race came to be, and we started started teaching our children this you know the story about the ape man on all fours slowly but surely standing up and then walking upright sitting behind a computer. That's all all as nonsensical as anything else you can come up with. That's just another theory that has never really been proven. And I need to remind people that which I do in my presentations that still remains a theory of evolution. It is not a fact of evolution. It remains a theory of evolution. But we've started teaching it as fact, and many people now believe that it's a scientific fact, which it is not. Mm -hmm. Just like it's the, you know, the, the theory of the origins of, of the universe is now being put to the Big Bang. The Big Bang is where the universe comes from. Well, that's just a theory. We don't know where the universe comes from. So all these things, and, and even Einstein's theory of relativity, these are all theories. But because our education system is completely and utterly controlled by those who print the money, and we're going to come back to that, uh, you realize what the agenda is. And, and 
once you start seeing the, the obsession with gold, the control of humanity, how humans have been controlled and manipulated over thousands and thousands of years to where it leads to today. The same group of people that were controlling the money 6,000 years ago with the, when we find the first Sumerian clay tablets and the first references of money and banks and the temples in Sumeria that acted as banks and the priest kings that, that acted as the first bankers. It's spectacular when you start putting that together. <laughs> you realize yeah. that nothing has changed, you know. It is crazy. I mean, we talked a little bit about the physical geological evidence, the stone circles, the gold mining things that you found, the tools. Um, but you also s suggest that it's not that this uh, this alien race came down here and just found some stupid people and uh, tricked them into this big gold mining operation. There's apparently evidence that we were actually genetically engineered. Um, can you go through some of that evidence, maybe in uh, yeah. our own DNA? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, th th this, this DNA um, evidence has been lurking uh, in the background for many decades. Uh, it's just the people that discovered the DNA. You know, what's fascinating is that um, I'm not sure if it was Watson or Crick uh, or both of them that, that admitted that they were both high on DMT or, or, um, or, yeah. or acid when they actually came to, to, to see the imagery and, and discover the double helix of the DNA. What's fascinating is that we get to the, the, the Sumerian translations, especially in Sitchin's work, is, speci is absolutely specific about how the human race came to be, how the Anunnaki found the gold. They mined it themselves for a long time until they realized they weren't getting enough of it and they needed help. So they decided to clone a new species specifically for the purpose to help them mine the gold, to be the slaves in the gold mining operation. And that's where humanity suddenly makes its appearance. And many of the things that I present in my work and my research points to that event, especially the discovery of Adam's calendar as a flagship among the millions and millions of stone circular ruins. Uh, and I need to just put this into context. I'm not talking about a few hundred or a few thousand circular stone structures. I'm talking more than 10 million stone circles scattered throughout South Africa and Zimbabwe and wow. parts of Botswana and Mozambique. More than 10 million. In fact... You know, in, in, in the latest few lectures I've been talking about, this, probably closer to 20 million based on my latest sort of gut feel after I sort of did a, a, a first analysis calculation and I was trying to be as scientific about it as I could using um, averages and averaging it from a, a small number of ruins per hectare then take it out to, a, you know, a square kilometer and then and larger and larger getting averages and then averaging it out over the whole area that I find these stone circles throughout southern Africa it adds up to more than 10 million. Now, that immediately tells us that there's a vanished civilization that we know absolutely nothing about. And, you know, we can't deny it anymore. Right. And, um, and so this connects us to the fact that, you know, there are more than 75,000 gold mines discovered just around one little town of Leidenberg, which is about 50 miles from where I live. And if you start extrapolating that to many of the other mines that I've discovered and spoken to people making discoveries uh, you know, of ancient gold mines uh, in the 20s and 30s already in South Africa, you start extrapolating that we've got millions of gold mines, vanished you know, gold mines that no longer can be seen. And every now and then we accidentally stumble upon these gold mines. One such example, I must tell you, was, uh, was in the early 70s when uh, the father of the guy that actually is our legal advisor, uh, Raymond Dix, his father worked for the mining industry on the West Strand uh, in a town called Carltonville. Uh, a lot of all the early gold mines in the 60s and 70s, that's where they arose in South Africa. And all, a lot of the global gold came from that area. I grew up in those areas on the gold fields. And they actually called gold fields, believe it or not. <laughs> and, and, uh, and he told me that one day they went into a sinkhole. Uh, the Carltonville area is a sinkhole um, sort of well, well known for its sinkholes and they just suddenly appear out of nowhere and you know houses disappear and tennis courts and people disappear into the sinkholes and uh, it, it used to be a very unsafe area at one stage and um, especially when I was growing up there in the, in the uh, late 60s and throughout the 70s and, uh, and Raymond's father told me that uh, in the early 70s he was part of this rescue team who were really well trained, well equipped to go down underground into the mines and rescue miners if they are trapped or if they are fires or whatever. 
and they were messing around testing their equipment. They went down into one of these sinkholes uh, about 20 meters deep, so it would make it about 60 feet deep. And at the bottom of it, they found one of the sides was caved in. They made their clear it out and made their way into what they found to be a tunnel that was perfectly paved with these perfect um, bricks or paving stones all the way around. And uh, several meters into the dark tunnel, they discovered uh, an exact replica statue, what you find often uh, in ancient books and in, in, uh, in South America, of uh, Viracocha, the, the Inca god Viracocha, who's inextricably linked to the mining of gold. So that is just incredible. You know, I also present the physical evidence that you can link every ancient civilization from the Sumerians, the Phoenicians, the Romans, the Greeks, the the um, the Hindu Dravidians from southern India and Sri Lanka, to the uh, uh, to the Incas, as I mentioned, and also the Dogon people of Mali. You can connect and link them to their activity here in South Africa many many thousands of years ago, and the Egyptians as well, where they unk and, and various other symbols, um, to the, the activity here in South Africa long long before the other so-called cultures and civilizations arose and um, I can say that because I've looked at the, 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 the carvings that they left behind that indicate their presence here of those people where those civilizations arise from and you, if you just look at the erosion on these carvings you realize that we're dealing with something extremely old, it's not something that you know, was carved just a few thousand years ago but um, I think just to come back to, I digress a bit from the genetic cloning side because mm -hmm. <laughs> There are a lot of geneticists that have, that have um, unfortunately, it's such a vast subject, it's very easy to slide, slip away into a, a, a sideline and get carried off. Of course, that's a positive thing. That's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So to come back to the genetic cloning side of it, it's really, you know, the, our whole human DNA is a huge mystery. There's so many anomalies to do with what's going on with our DNA. The fact that we use so little of it, and yet there's so much potential encoded in it. Uh, what came first, the RNA, the DNA? Um, how did it all happen? How did we get to to be to be this very bright species, uh, while all the others are completely, you know, far removed from our level of understanding and intelligence? And 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 um, <clears throat> why do we have uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes, and the, the ape species have 24 pairs of chromosomes, and so it goes? And many geneticists have have um, put out categorical statements on record that our DNA is not of this planet. Our DNA is of an alien source. Now, obviously, the mainstream media and the education departments and the textbooks at school are not going to pick up on that. They're going to continue printing and teaching the children and our students what they want us to believe. So you're not going to find that in mainstream education until you start looking at those who are working on the fringes and doing some ridiculously exciting and interesting research. Uh, and one such researcher it work, now works with Nassim Haramein in Hawaii. His name is William Brown, and he's a, one of the brightest lights in the field of genetics and, and DNA research. And uh, William, uh, you know, if you just look him up and go to his website, you'll get a lot of interesting information about our DNA and, and what it really is. DNA is not what we think it is, and it actually is formed in completely different ways uh, to what we believe. And um, <clears throat> that makes it even more interesting and exciting, because that brings us to the, the many belief systems that we find in ancient cultures. Not only that the human race was created by the gods that came down from the sky, that all ancient cultures keep telling us about, and we keep denying it, because our textbooks say so, uh, but they also tell us about how the universe was created, and how everything came into being. And at the, at the foundation of that is this thing called sound or resonance. And that's fantastic because you start seeing very important breakthroughs in some of the leading scientific research, especially also Nassim Haramein with his resonance project, and more and more um, breakthrough research, like, for example, even nerve endings, you know, share their, their information with the nerves and the synapses that in our brains uh, are actually information gets transfer, transferred via sound waves and sound patterns. And, uh, and you start realizing that sound is at the core of all these things. And that's really critical because that's what I've discovered. These millions of stone circles are all about. Mm -hmm. 
they generate huge amounts of sound energy, and um, and that 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 then leads to the conclusion that whoever built these were incredibly advanced in their knowledge, their understanding of the laws of nature, and um, and then what they did with it. Mm-hmm. And then obviously the, the obvious conclusion is, and the evidence points, it was all about the gold. Yeah, I mean, let's talk about the, uh, you know, you mentioned sound a little bit. You've put a lot of emphasis on the power of sound and resonance in some of your speeches, and it's, it seems like most of the knowledge that our ancestors had, whether you're talking about this sound technology or the flower of life knowledge or the things that they've embedded in some of the ancient symbols. A lot of that's been lost or gone underground, but um, can you tell us a bit about this, about sound and what you've discovered about it? I mean, you seem to consider it a lost energy system. Well, yeah, uh, absolutely. Because yeah, I, I really believe that this is what Nikola Tesla discovered. Mm-hmm. Well, I must just tell you, you know, just in case that your listeners are still not getting it. Every one of these sun circles, these 10 million sun circles, or more more than 10 million sun circles, is a sound energy generating device. Okay, okay. there's no doubt about it. There's scientific measurements, um, uh, and each one resonates at very very high sound frequency in the gigahertz. The lowest we've measured, and uh, this is the lowest, is around 10 gigahertz. Now this is insane. You don't you don't measure sound frequencies in the gigahertz in nature. It just doesn't happen, right? <laughs> Remember that our hearing only goes up to about 16,000 hertz. Right. So, you know, the gigahertz, gigahertz is way up there. It's extremely high frequencies with extremely high energies. The higher the frequency, the higher the energy. So as a result of these very high sound frequencies that these stone circles vibrate at, um, they generate huge amounts of electromagnetic energy and electromagnetic fields that we've also measured. So this is not just speculation. This is scientifically measured, proven, and shown in the work that I've done. And uh, so we've got free energy devices sitting here staring us in the face, and we don't know how to use them. Except I believe this is exactly what Nikola Tesla found when he built his uh, you know, uh, Tesla Tower on Long Island in 1902 or 1903, whatever it was, and and I believe he actually discovered uh, the sound frequency and the resonance of planet Earth and was able to tap into it and then convert that sound energy to his radiant or, or, or his non-lethal form of energy that he could beam anywhere around the world and could put to use, whether it was in airplanes or ships or cars or lights or whatever, um, without killing anyone. And, um, and, and that's why it was removed from the face of the earth because you couldn't charge for it you know and uh, JP Morgan obviously wanted to make sure he could charge people for the electricity that Tesla developed so you start seeing the 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 layers of deception and control creeping in here and crawling in here and um, uh, I've been asked on several occasions to I'm lying I've been asked on two occasions to (laughs) to appear on on ancient aliens on on the TV show Ancient Aliens, yeah. And after about a month, yeah. After about a month of talking to the producers of Ancient Aliens, suddenly I get an email saying, "Sorry, we'll no longer be interviewing you." And I've been wondering about why that is. And it suddenly hit me that you know most of what they talk about on Ancient Aliens is really exciting and interesting information, and it has uh, incredible discoveries and so forth. But when you get to showing physical evidence of ancient sites that actually are energy generating devices that still give us energy that cannot be de- you know denied we show it scientifically that changes the the game completely doesn't it it does <laughs> yes it really does um, it and will- and it's no longer speculation it's no longer maybe it was or maybe they were doing that with it because now we know exactly what they were doing and my gut feel is that, remember, the, the History Channel is still controlled by the same Illuminati families that run the global media syndicate, and they sort of drip-feed the information to the mainstream and to the, to the global populace. And I think that telling the global people that we're sitting on 10 million free energy-generating devices in South Africa, and they're not just here. I find them all over the world. In fact, Area 51 has got a bunch of them as well. 
uh, once that information gets out there, that's not going to be good for those who control the energy grid and the enslavement of the human race through controlling the energy supply. Well, let's talk about how how did uh, the situation change? You have the Anunnaki here. You have a slave race of humans that have been engineered. Uh, was there a rebellion? What happened to the Anunnaki? Did they leave or did they just go into the shadows? Very important question and a very, very uh, question that doesn't really have very clear answers. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the big, let's, let's move backwards. What is happening sure. with the gold today? Uh, it, it seems like there is no gold on earth. All the gold's missing, right? Right. Think about what's going on with the gold. All, all the countries that are suddenly looking for gold from the United States or deposited in the, with the USA. Germany last year was looking for their gold and were told, sorry, we don't have your gold. It's, I think it was about 3,500 tons of gold that Germany had deposited with the USA. And that gold is gone. Um, Brazil wanted its gold. They were told, we don't have your gold. Venezuela, Chavez wanted his gold. And, uh, you know, wh why do you think the, the Western um, leadership uh, was so vehemently opposed to Hugo Chavez, who was a darling of the people in Venezuela? Because he was completely opposed to the draconian uh, control of the, of, the re of the people by the rest of the global um, powers. And he was moving in opposite directions. So of course, they didn't like him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and then, so, so the gold is a big question. Uh, What's interesting, um, this is just what came up the other day in one of my presentations, is when you spell the word gold, if you take the L out of gold, you get God. And L, as an E-L, is shortened version of the Elohim, the gods of the Bible. Remember, the, the gods of the Bible, Elohim, is a plural, so it's always the gods, never the singular God, as it was incorrectly translated or manipulated into incorrect translation. So you start realizing that even in some of the lang encoded language that we use, there's a very interesting crossover. And this might sound like a silly little remark that I'm making. Let me reassure you, this is not a silly little <laughs> sideline issue. This is deeply encoded numeric energetic structure that is encoded into our language that we are completely unaware of. And that is directly connected to the so-called Tower of Babel incident where the God said, let us go down and confuse their language because if they can do this, they can become like us. It has nothing to do with changing the people's languages so that they can't understand each other. It's got everything to do with manipulating the energetic uh, effect of the letters and the, that make up the words so that they lose their meaning and the power to actually manifest matter throughout the sound frequencies that they generate. I know I'm going a little over the top here, but let me tell you, this is why this research is so mind-blowingly exciting, because it takes you down these weird channels of research that you never imagined you'd go into and discover this whole new vast volume of research into energy fields and sound frequency and manifestation and vortexes and the vacuum and you know, quantum physics and metaphysics and so forth, and you realize it's, it's all connected. So, <laughs> right. It is where is the gold? Yeah, where, where is the gold? You know, where is the gold? The it, gold is, is not the, here. Is it in the Vatican what banks? Is, what, no, well, <laughs> I guess the, much of it is probably hidden and stored in the Vatican. Um, oh, boy, the gold, the gold. <laughs> That's the big thing. Uh, remember that our obsession with the gold, human obsession, with gold is not a human obsession. We inherited that from the right. gods. And I say specifically the gods in the Bible, the Elohim, God, comes to, to in Genesis 2, when Adam is alone on earth. Eve had not yet been fashioned from his rib. So Adam is alone on earth. He's never heard of gold. He's got no worries about gold, right? I'm now going with the flow of the story. And God comes to Adam, and it's God or the Elohim the gods that bring up the matter of gold. They, to, they tell Adam about this land called Havilah, where the land is good, the water is good, and by the way, there is gold. <laughs> so it's critical to realize that humans were not the ones that found the obsession with gold. We inherited it from the gods. And that becomes very critical when you start reading the, the ancient records uh, from 500 years ago, well not ancient, just uh, the other day, when the conquistadors and the thugs from Europe 
started conquering the, the native uh, people of the world under the, um, the control of the Vatican. And they started arriving in the Americas and Africa and, and, and India, Asia. Wherever they arrived, they found the native populations had vast amounts of gold. Isn't that fascinating? It is. It's really, really strange. I mean, do you, do you think that uh, the Anunnaki in, in somehow in the shadows is still picking up shipments of gold? Absolutely. There's not, no really? doubt about it. Really? And, and no doubt about it. And uh, that the gold is still leaving this planet. It's not here. It's not on this planet. It's going off planet. And, and just because it's not on the 8 o'clock news and you're not seeing it on CNN doesn't mean it's not happening. Remember that if NASA did a, a launch of the space shuttle and they didn't show it on TV, nobody would know about it. That's true, man. It's I, that simple. It really is. And this kind of touches on, you know, the famous David Icke stuff, that the global elite are descendants of the Anunnaki. And I've always thought motivation-wise, you know, what is the motivation for some of these global elite to keep going to meetings, to keep – uh, controlling the population because if I had a billion dollars in the bank, I wouldn't give a fuck what anybody else did. I would just secure my own freedom, hole up, and do my own thing. But you know, these people are still like basically working a nine to five, and there's got to be a motivation behind that. It's all about total control. It's all about total and absolute control of the human race, and this is where it comes to where we are today. So it started out with Anunnaki arriving here some 500,000 years ago. I don't know. Those numbers are very fuzzy, so don't, you know, don't take it too, you know, don't stick to it too exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and at around 300,000 years ago, and that, that seems to be reasonably accurate, at about 300,000 years ago, um, although there are various uh, periods during which they seem to have created different types of beings. So that becomes fuzzy again. But at around 300,000 years ago, we see the sudden appearance of Homo sapiens or, or the species that we seem to belong to today. Um, there weren't, they weren't many races. There was one race. Okay? So that becomes another huge question. Well, where do the different race groups come from if we all come from the same seed? That's a huge problem. Okay? I'll ask any geneticist that's really looked into this. That's a big problem. Um, where do different race groups come from? And then, and, and Anunnaki created this, this new species and this is, by the way, where Adam's calendar comes in that was discovered by Johann Heine, um, my initial colleague in the research into the stone circles. Johann Heine rediscovered um, Adam's calendar, which I called it Adam's calendar after I started researching it, in 2003 by accident. And later I discovered that it's an ancient site known by the African shaman, especially the, the famous Zulu shaman Kredo Mutwa, who is probably the preeminent shaman in, in, in Africa, one of the most important knowledge keepers of African and human history, uh, Credo makes it very clear to me and to everyone else that Adam's calendar, as he calls it, Inzalo Yelanga, which means birthplace of the sun, as in S-O-N, the son of the gods, this is where humanity was created by the gods. And that's, that's it. It's as simple as it is. If you don't want to believe it, that's fine. That's your own problem. Get on with your life. Get, get go to your nine to five job and you know retire and die. Right, right. <laughs> Otherwise, get, get, get caught up in this amazing new wave of information that's reaching us. Realize that it's far more mysterious and intriguing than we could have ever imagined. So here we find ourselves at Adam's calendar or in Zalo Yelanga, and that is the flagship among all these millions of stone ruins. Because that, I believe, is actually one of the portals that they used to beam the gold up from. And I have plenty of scientific evidence for making such a ridiculous and outlandish suggestion. So uh, it gets really exciting. So I believe the gold is still leaving, but there is still huge amounts of gold on this planet, buried in underground tunnels, uh, in secret places. And southern Africa is one of those places where... Probably most of that buried gold is found. The Mesoamericas and South America, Peru, um, Peru, Bolivia, um, and so forth. Those that part of the world is also has got huge amounts of underground tunnels with huge amounts of buried gold. I'm talking about processed gold, not gold in ore. Processed gold bars and coins that are lying in these tunnels. Now the technology to find that exists. There are many people that have this technology. And um, I've been privy to to such information from 
the guys that have been researching it, and when you start seeing the amount of gold that is hidden in these tunnels, it raises a whole lot of questions. The fact that they're still processing it and getting it off this planet um, under the cover of, of, of night or um, away from, you know, out of sight and making sure that those areas are secured and the gold gets extracted and removed and nobody knows about it. Yeah, that is really wild. I mean, l I mean, so you got this system where, you know, we've been programmed to worship gold. We've been programmed to be controlled by money. Um, and let's switch gears a little bit and talk about money um, in the modern world. You know, I have a ton of guests that come through and talk about lies and corruption and ending the Fed, et cetera. But nine out of ten times when I try to take it a step further and say we should get beyond capitalism altogether, it's like a switch goes off in their head and they immediately start defending capitalism as if they're on trial during the Red Scare. I mean, can you break down for the people <laughs> how uh, – how money and capitalism are like a big part of the foundation of our problems. Okay, absolutely. And that's critical because once you've you know become uh, comfortable and gone over the shock that we are slave species created by these gods, these, these beings. And remember, this is also, I just need to also draw the distinction for a lot of people that might find themselves lost from a spiritual perspective. This is where you draw the very clear distinction between God with a big G or the divine creative force behind the universe and all the beautiful things in it, the divine creation, if you want to call it that, the God, with, which I call the God with a big G. And I also have a feeling that this is where the the the, the Freemasons actually get the, the big G in their symbol, the grand, the, the grand architect or the great architect. I believe that they're actually referring to a similar kind of entity or the sound, the om, the alm, or the word of God right, that created the universe and all things in it. And you draw a big distinction between the God with a big G and the gods with a small G, the gods of the Bible that you most come into contact with and the gods that we read about in all ancient cultures that just were advanced beings from another planet and, and probably many other planets that came to Earth, found gold, manipulated their way, abused a species that they created for their own benefit, and um, and created all these rules and regulations so that they could carry on controlling the people and the beings that they created. All the time knowing and being very acutely aware of what we have been told in great detail for more than 50 years now by Star Trek. And if your listeners don't know this yet, most of the stuff you ever see in Star Trek is accurate and true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And one of the... One of the key things that we are taught in Star Trek is this universal law called the Prime Directive. Now, I talk quite a great deal about this in my sort of full-day workshops because it's critical to start pulling all these things together and understanding how the manipulation of the human race is taking place today. And that the Prime Directive is being used and abused and manipulated uh, to the benefit of those who are, who are the manipulators of the human race, with a full understanding by them that if they cross the prime directive, if they do not abide by it, by it, it will cause their own demise. And this is critical information that I'm sharing with you here, because once you start understanding the, the resonance, the morphogenic field, the way that the entire universe and everything in creation vibrates in sympathetic harmony, once you realize that, you realize that anything that that contradicts that, that is not in sympathetic harmony, that is not in resonance, that is in dissonance, will cause its own destruction and demise. I don't know if it's making sense to you. No, yes, it is. Yeah. So it's really a very simple principle. So um, so the, the guys, call them the Anunnaki remnants or whoever they've become, it is really unclear because they masters at deception. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of people have gone on record and made these bold statements and then find out later that they weren't exactly right. So let's just realize that somebody is pulling the strings, manipulating us on this physical level, enslaving us physically, mentally, emotionally, and more, most importantly, spiritually, making us forget that we are part, infinite fractals of the divine creator, that God is within us, that we have the same capacity to create and manifest, the same way that great, you know, um, Prophets like Joshua or Jesus or Yeshua, call him what you want, and many others that came before him and since him have told us that God is within you, that you can move mountains if you have faith. And that faith is not believing in a guy with a white stick, a white beard and a stick in the clouds. Well, that, that means believing and understanding.
understanding that you are one with the divine creator, that you're that you're a fractal of the divine creator. I hear so, what you're saying. Give me. Let me ask um, you uh, one quick question though about this, as we're talking about spirituality before we get into uh, some of the the monetary control stuff. I mean, I completely understand how, you know, some people think we are, you know, bodies are vessels for infinite consciousness here to experience, you know, a 3D material plane. You know, we are fractals of the great God or, you know, what have you. Um, I understand that. But then also the fact that we are genetically engineered, it almost seems like the two are in opposition. I can't seem to rationalize that because in the same way we make computers, uh, you know, it's like they made us, and it's. I see, like, we're, we wouldn't have a natural yeah. place in the universe, so how do we then become uh, beings of consciousness? Right, and this is where the work of Enki comes in, and I believe that I have some sort of a metaphysical connection to Enki, and a lot of this information is either revealed to me in, in weird ways or, or in, in other literature and so forth, and, um, and I guess this is why I've been making these discoveries. Uh, because this is all Enki's work that I'm sharing with the world, this mining operation here and so forth. Enki was also the, the guy that had the knowledge to create, to do the, the genetic um, uh, coding and the, the genetic um, manipulation into creating the new species. And uh, Zachariah Sitchin goes into great detail in, men, in, in more than 14 of his books into how this all happened. And this is where Enki's work comes in. He realized that, that by creating a primitive species that was trapped and could not evolve consciously he would be he would be contravening the prime directive and therefore he created a creature and it's very clear in the translations of Sitchin and this is fantastic when you start putting these pieces of the puzzle together where you read where he encoded the and and I love the name that the the Sumerians tablets give the DNA they call it the entwined essence which is so much more eloquent than DNA, isn't it? Mm, yeah, that's good. Um, and uh, so when he gave the entwined essence more um, uh, parts that would allow the creature to grow and to evolve and to become and to become wise and etc. So he allowed the creature to grow in its own consciousness and reach high levels of consciousness and then join at some stage in the future, join the universal community of conscious beings okay so that is really the process that he started knowing that at some stage they would lose control of the slave race that they created allowing them to become beings of their own consciousness that was overridden by those who didn't want to let go and didn't want to allow this new species to reach their own universal um, harmonious uh, consciousness with with the divine source from which we come and it is that control that is now being imposed on us and has been imposed on us for thousands of years. And I think it probably started happening from my research seems to indicate that it started to happen. That control started to happen after the Great Flood about 12,000 to 13,000 years ago or around that period. After which a lot of this, this, this whole vast gold mining empire was destroyed by the flood. A lot of that evidence is found here that I present in my in my workshops and presentations. And, um, uh, and, and so Enki allowed us to grow consciously. And it is now at that, we're at that point where we are, we are discovering our, our divine seed in our, in our DNA and that we are ultimately destined for um, you know, rejoining the, the, the source and, uh, and I believe that many of the breakthroughs that we've had in science and physics, especially quantum physics, I believe that, like, for example, the double slit experiment is a beautiful example that actually is the, is the key and critical evidence uh, and that gives us the tools to understand uh, or allow us to move back and, 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 uh, and allow us the understanding to reunite with source. Uh, once we start understanding the really strange nature of matter at a quantum level, that it completely contradicts the, you know, Newtonian physics, and uh, and supports uh, much of what ancient cultures have been talking about, uh, talking to us about uh, and about the power of thought and mind and how we can manifest and so forth. So yeah, it's critical. I think that what the Anunnaki also did is they they did a lot of 
a lot of damage on this planet. Uh, th there's no doubt about that. But at the same time, I think there are many of them who are still around, possibly not in a physical form, but a, a higher level spiritual form, that are doing as much as they can to help millions of us wake up and realize that uh, we can and have the potential and, and have the ability to step out of this trap and this enslavement. And money is the tool of enslavement. So let's come back to this money. It, I think sure. it's important at this Absolutely. stage. Um, it, it's, it's very important. And for those of you, and if, if you, if you in the United States uh, during the month of July uh, and August, please look at my website where I'm going to be presenting. Um, I've got 16 or 18 venues um, um, in mostly in sort of Western United States and, uh, and, and the South. Um, and come look at one of our presentations to, to get a, a better perspective of what I'm talking about. But money is not what people think. Okay, The entire global monetary system was created by the Anunnaki and given to the Sumerian priest kings. When you read the Sumerian tablets, there is no mention of money at all among the Anunnaki or the Anunna gods. The only time money comes into question is when they talk and deal with human beings. Suddenly money appears. And it is very clear now from our research that the first money appeared shortly after the flood. Money is not a process or part of evolution, um, so-called evolution. That is what the, the, the historians and those who are trying to deceive us with writing disinformation in our history books have tried to deceive us. They try to link the evolution of money to the evolution of the human race. And that is not true because that will make us believe that sort of it's hand in hand that money evolved out of thousands of years of barter and trade. That is an absolute lie. That is not true. Money suddenly and mysteriously and overnight appeared um, in humanity. And uh, I found the, the physical evidence for this uh, the other day. It is brand new information. And, you know, you've got to scratch and look around for these things. And it's once again in the form of a Sumerian clay tablet that is in the British Museum of all places, right there, in plain sight, as it always is, isn't it? Mm, yeah. And um, and this clay tablet, this clay, what ha first of all, what happened after the flood is when we first see the appearance of kings and priest kings. This is when kingdoms on earth appear. Suddenly, out of the blue, you suddenly see kings rule the world. And, and that's just the most bizarre and mysterious thing that could ever happen. All you've got to do is ask yourself, how did these kings come to be? Who were they and how were they so powerful that they could suddenly impose themselves on all the other people with whom they must have lived before they became kings? Right? Uh -huh. So here I am. I'm living, I'm living in my community, in my village or my town. Everyone's living together. And suddenly tomorrow morning I wake up and I have a bright idea and I call everybody together and I, and I tell them, listen, um, as of tomorrow, I'm going to be this thing called a king. I'm going to rule over all of you here in this town and village, and uh, all this land now belongs to me, and uh, you're going to have to work my land to be able to live on it, and you're going to have to pay me taxes or bring me food so that you can live on this land that now belongs to me. What do you think the, pe the rest of the people in the community are going to do to you if you try and impose yourself like that on them? <laughs> yeah, you'd think they'd be uh, coming at right? you with pitchforks. Exactly. So, how kingdoms suddenly appeared out of the blue is a great mystery. And yet the Sumerian tablets give us, once again, as they always seem to do, give us a very clear indication that the kingdom was lowered to earth from heaven when the gods came down and appointed kings from among the men to rule over the people. And these priest kings, they were also the priests because they were the, 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 the communicator between the gods and the people. These priests, early priest kings, that suddenly appear after the flood, were given huge knowledge. They were given, like, um, magic, magical tricks that they could perform, with which they could subdue and control the people. And that is how they took control of the people, through fear and, and subordination and, and, uh, and, and uh, subjugation. Right? It, the people didn't willingly, you know, <laughs> enslave themselves to the kings. They were forced into working for these new priest kings that had these weird magical powers. And the first thing that these priest kings did, they introduced money. 
and the concept of money and remunerating people with money. The other important thing is that money was never in the form of gold. Money was always in the form of silver because the money belong, the gold belongs to the gods, like all the ancient cultures told the, the conquistadors when they arrived in the Americas. When they asked, well, who does all the gold belong to? They were told, the gold belongs to the gods, just as they did in Africa and in India, everywhere. So the gold was never used for money, and silver was always the first form of money. Now the clay tablet that I show is a beautiful example from 2046 BC, from a Sumerian temple, where the priest kings were operating as the bankers, and the Sumerian temples were already operating as the first banks. And this clay tablet is probably the oldest bill of exchange that is available to be seen today. It's spectacular, and it, it records wow. in writing, in a clay tablet, the deposit of eight silver shekels into the bank, into the temple, to the priest king by this guy, and, uh, and in return he gets given this clay tablet. It's spectacular. Wow. Nothing has changed. <laughs> yeah, that is crazy. And it's, I guess the hardest thing to wrap your head around for some people is that this same mechanism would have lasted so long, but I feel like you can look into some some yeah. neighborhoods just here in Southern California. You can see families of old money that has been there for how many generations? You know, I mean, it doesn't it doesn't take that big of a leap of faith to see that when something is instilled on people that it doesn't go away without some type of real radical change. It's still here today. Yeah. So, you know, once you start realizing that money was synthetically introduced as a tool of enslavement and, I mean, of absolute control and absolute enslavement, uh, it just replaces physical enslavement. You still have to work for those who control the money. And who, who minted the money in the ancient times? The priest kings. Who wrote the bills of exchange? The priest kings. People couldn't read and write in those days. People could only read and write from very recently people very recent years there's still millions and millions of large percentages of un, uneducated and illiterate people in the world so only those in ancient times only the priests the, and the priest kings and their scribes could write and could issue these bills of exchange so they could do what they want with those people and put the royal seal on it and take total control of the people for already more than 4,000 years ago that's how far the evidence goes and I believe it goes a lot further back in time um, so the same system goes today. Those royal bloodlines have been in power and control of this planet for thousands and thousands of years. David Icke has shown that in great detail and many other researchers. I don't have to redo that. I'm just picking up and showing the link of money and how that's been controlled together with the origins of humankind, the gold mining empire of Southern Africa, and where we are today. And unless we get rid of money... And unless we stop using this form of control that these banking families are imposing on every single living, breathing human being through our governments, through our large multinational corporations, until we stop using their private money, we will remain forever enslaved. That is the big awakening I believe we all have to go through. Man, I completely agree with you there. And that's what's so uh, scary to me and off-putting when somebody defends capitalism so aggressively uh, and refuses to think that there could be an evolution beyond that. But you actually, before we go, I want to talk about the system that you suppose, which is uh, Ubuntu contributionism. Can you tell us a bit about what that is? Yeah, it's, it's a simple system that's been used for thousands of years by native people of the world. Every native population around the world used the system of what Africans call Ubuntu. And um, I called it contributionism when I first uh, wrote Slave Species of the Gods. I realized that we need to move beyond money, that money is the absolute tool of control. It is the hurdle to all progress. And, you know, without money, we can't seem to do anything. The moment you remove money and you just put people there and their will to create and to, to develop and to initiate, to, to, to invent and to build and to construct, you suddenly have this huge abundance. So... I propose the system of Ubuntu, which has the five-point mantra, no money, no barter, no trade, no value attached to anything greater than anything else, because all of our contributions are and should always be equally valuable. And finally, 
a system and a society where everybody contributes their God-given talents or their acquired skills and passions to the greatest benefit of everyone and all in their community. It's as simple as that. You don't need money. We need love. We need food. We need water, shelter. We need science. We need architecture. We need beautiful. We need arts and culture. We need all the beautiful things that we can imagine in the world. The one thing we don't need is money. That is the one thing and the hurdle that prevents us from getting all those beautiful things that we've all been imagining in our lives. And uh, and to maybe finish, because I see we've done an hour already, yeah. Just it's really important to, to realize that a lot of people argue, say, oh, it's not money is not the evil, it's the love of money. No, you're still disillusioned. You're still trying to find some sort of a, you know, uh, a, an answer that money should be used. No. Money is the reason why we are so screwed up. Money is the cause for all the problems. It's the presence of money. It's the mere presence of money that creates all the problems. The moment you remove money, all our problems, the crime, the greed, the gluttony, the seven deadly sins, the envy, all that disappears. No hoarding. You don't have to worry about anything because everything is available to everyone all the time. Now, in my new book, which is about to be released probably in the next week or two, hopefully before I go to the USA, uh, it will be released as an ebook first, so check out my website for that. In there I go, go into great detail about the history of this, how it all connects, and how we should start moving and thinking about moving into these Ubuntu communities that work without money and creating abundance on every level of human endeavor. Man, that is awesome, and that book in particular is something I definitely would like to get my hands on. I mean, this is something that I've been preaching for a while, and I face so much resistance in, in talking about the fact that money is the problem. And one of the biggest points of resistance, if we can get say a few more things before we go, um, is that a lot of people would argue that we don't have the technology or resources to have unlimited energy, water, and food for everyone on the planet, and that money is an artificial barrier between people and resources, which is necess a necessary evil to manage those resources. But what would you say to those people? That's just a, a fallacy. It's absolute hogwash. They don't know what they're talking about. They're just, they're just regurgitating the propaganda they, they, they hear on the news or read in the papers. It's, it's, it's absolutely insane. We live on a planet of abundance. Abundance. I mean, there are people that grow enough food in, in, in six square meters to feed a whole family for a whole year. You know, it's, there are examples of abundance around us. But unfortunately, those examples are never shown. They are suppressed. People are prevented from growing their own food. Some places in the world, you're not allowed to grow your own food anymore. Monsanto is destroying our natural crops and our, and our Eden seeds, if you can call them that, so they can control the food supply. It's all about absolute control of the human race so that we can continue being enslaved. Um, we live on a planet of abundance. The moment you start working... Stop spending 90% of your energy chasing money because at the end of the day, that's what 90% of the global population does. From the moment we open our eyes to the moment we go to bed, we are doing something that is going to bring us money so we can pay the rent, pay the mortgage, pay the electricity, buy the bread and the milk and somehow survive until the end of the month and then do it all, all over again. That is not why we were brought into this planet. That is how we were enslaved to live on this planet. And this is why the ancient cultures lived in absolute harmony. When the, when the, when the conquistadors came to America, there was no hunger. There was no poverty. People had as much food as they, as, as they wanted to create for themselves. In Africa, people lived in abundant communities of absolute abundance. There was no starvation. There was no, no homelessness. There was no begging on the streets. That does, that's a Western capitalist construct that has just completely destroyed the planet. Um, and I know that a lot of people struggle with this. You know, we're, we're, po we're so poisoned by capitalism that we forget to look at how it totally and utterly controls our lives. And I think one of the biggest things, when you talk to people about a world without money, they associate money with wealth and having stuff. So they think that a lack of money means poverty and starvation. No, no, no. It's completely the opposite. A world without money means a world without obstacles and hurdles to progress. It means 
that when everybody wakes up in the morning, they live in a place they choose to live. They do what they choose to do because that is what they are best at. That's their natural talents with which they contribute towards the greater welfare of their own community. And therefore, they are well respected and loved by the people in the community and not, you know, envied or whatever. Um, and, and they spend very little time and energy on chasing money because there's no money to chase. In the Ubuntu communities, I call this a labor of love. There are no jobs. There are no careers. You have a labor of love. And that is who you are. And that's what your life is. And you don't have to worry about retiring and, and saving money so that you can retire. Because the communities look after each other. And they look after each other. And there is well-being and there is abundance. From, from rocket science, if you think about if you let the scientists and the inventors and the farmers loose and there was no restriction on how much they can develop, design, and grow. What do you think is going to happen? <laughs> right. You, when, you, when, you start, when you start going, when you come to my presentation, I start taking you through this, you realize very quickly that we're going to have to slow down. Because if you spend more than, and I work with sacred geometry on some of these models, because it's important to bring sacred geometry into some of these relationships with wh who we are and how we, how we live on this planet. We need to live within the, the natural um, order of things, which, which is what I call it as well. And this is why you can't screw it up, because we're actually tapping into the natural order of things. So I, I propose that we only, we only apply our labor of love for the community that you choose to live in for three hours a day. So whether, you, whether you're a rocket scientist and you're building rockets or developing free energy, uh, levitation devices, to being a farmer and developing the most amazing ways to grow food hydroponically or whichever way, abundance beyond belief, whether you're a shoemaker or a builder or designing new technology to build dwellings or purifying water, you, there, there are millions and millions of labors of love that people do that incidentally in today's society are not financially viable. That's why people don't do them. People don't do things today because they don't want to do them. They don't do stuff, millions of things that we should be doing. We don't do it because it's not financially viable. Mm -hmm. Not because we don't need it. That's another thing to you know, get, out of, get our heads out of. There are many pe millions of people that want to do certain things that they know will be good for the community, good for developing or, or improving this sector or that sector, but they're not allowed to do that because it's not financially viable. Or it will undermine the mining or the, the, the energy companies or the oil companies or the drug companies, you know. So um, you got to slow down. Three hours a day, I believe, is all that we would have to do doing our labor of love, what it is you love to do. And then after that, you still got 18 hours a day to do other things you love to do <laughs> in your own community. I mean, it seems so, so great. The abundance. Well, yeah. I just, it seems At the moment, I'll tell you, Greg, the, 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 moment you, the moment you remove money out of the system, it explodes with abundance. That's the most exciting thing that people need to recognize. And it's the fear, unfortunately. It's the fear factor. When you say the word a world without money, people think, oh, poverty, living in starvation, living in caves, going back to the dark ages. No, use your brain, please, people. If you remove money, you're turning it upside down. You expect exploding the potential. You're allowing people to develop things that we can't even imagine about developing. Free energy and, th and, and ways of life that we cannot even, we can't even dream of it today because we can't allow ourselves to think that far. It is ridiculous. I mean, we everybody knows now about the technology of 3D printers. And I mean, if every town had a community center, a library of 3D printers, I don't understand how you'd still have a Walmart or need slave labor from overseas when you can make your utensils in this in this machine. I mean, it's directly opposed to capitalism, and I wonder how, I mean, these things are definitely butting heads. I don't know how they're going to institute uh, 3D printing where you can make things when they're abundant and, uh, and keep capitalism around. No, well, it, you know, capitalism is only around because it's controlled by the royal banking bloodlines that have been around for thousands of years. And remember, they make money out of thin air. It's that simple. They just print as much money as they want to print so they can play this game for as long as they want and for as long as we allow them to. So it's up to us to say, listen, buddy, we're on to you. We know what you're doing. Your time's up. You know, you've had 6,000 years of, of fun and that's now coming to an end. And this is why I believe that this 2012 period is truly the, where we've entered the new age. 
and where people are waking up rapidly and realizing what's, what's been done to the human race for, so, for such a long, long period of time and standing up and saying, okay, that's it, no more. We've had enough. We're going to take back, back this planet. We're going to turn it back into the paradise it's supposed to be and live our lives the way that God, our Creator, intended us to live our lives in abundance and giving effect and using our God-given talents with which each and every one is born because that is what we are supposed to do, to use our talents. Man, it's fascinating stuff, and I know it's about that time. Before we go, I guess my last big question for you is, uh, what are some of the concrete ways you would suggest we transition into this society? Because I'm a very cynical and depressed person because I, I just don't think that people are waking up at the rate they must or uh, waking up to enough of the facts because it, it's hard to get past that last that last layer, which is uh, the monetary system. How would you institute these changes? How could we make some progress? Uh, there are going to have to be several and multiple prongs of approach. I don't want to use the word attack because that's negative. So let's use, we got to stop. First of all, we got to find ways to stop using the money that's printed by the private banking, by the private bankers. That's a tall order. But we got to start planning um, uh, an alternative currency system. First of all, we're not going to go from zero to hero overnight. They're going to have to be several transitional steps and stages that we have to go through as a society and different communities to go from complete enslavement uh, by money and capitalism and weaning ourselves off to the point where we don't use money at all and realize that we have abundance beyond our wildest dreams and we don't even think about money. So I believe that the small towns and villages and communities – that are you know far out of the urban city areas could be the seeds of this off the grid, completely um, self-sufficient and self-sustained communities that start to spring up from there. Uh, once you've got fresh water and you're generating your own energy, and hopefully free energy will be here very soon, and that'll collapse the the cartel very quickly. Um, I believe that once you start creating, once a community comes together and and pools its its money on a monthly basis and start to dictate to the authorities, whether it's a municipality or the council, whoever controls the supply of the services, the electricity, the water, whatever, starts to, to dictate to the councils of, of what the community wants. I call it the council of elders. Appoint a council of elders from within your community. Make it a sacred geometry number, 12 around 1, like the 12 disciples around Christ or, or Buddha or uh, and forth. And um, let that council of elders, the wisest people that you have, that everybody trusts in your community, let them let they make them the spokes body on behalf of the whole community so they can go and make demands on behalf of the community. If those demands are not met, then start pooling your money into a trust fund or a trust account that the, the, the elders keep control of and stop paying the those who are supposed to provide you with services until certain things get delivered. What can also then happen is you can have a vote of no confidence in your local council or municipality and replace the mayor and replace the council and replace them with your own council of elders. And very soon, very quickly, you can then have your own council that then controls the well-being and the expansion growth for the benefit of the town. That's on the sort of political front, now that, that kind of maneuver. On the other side, Start pooling the money in the community and start developing community projects. Obviously, the obvious important projects, whether it's free energy, food, um, uh, and water, and everything to do with creating, whether it's building materials and whatever the community can create, um, and start making that available for a fraction of the cost to those who participate in the community. That's why it's called contributionism. Right? You contribute your time and skills, and you get the reward of whatever else that community creates. And it's not a barter or trade. If I give you 10 eggs, I'm going to get one, one you know, loaf of bread or whatever. It's none of that. It's you contribute what you're good at, and that entitles you to have access to all the other things that are being contributed by all those who are contributing. So it's like a pooling of resources that everybody benefits from. So once your community is, is created, amount so much food and bread and cheese and building materials and windows or whatever you, you let your mind run wild right 
and you've made that available to everyone in your own community, all the, the rest of the stuff, because you've got to make a lot more, you make the rest of the stuff available to the people outside your community at a farmer's market or something that you establish that the neighboring communities will come to and get from you at a much lower cost than they can get it from their own community. The moment you've achieved that, you've created the domino effect and it's going to become impossible for your neighboring communities to continue operating on a capitalistic system. Their businesses will collapse. And either they will have to um, adopt the same system that you've got in your village and your community, or their businesses will go belly up. And that is, I believe, the trigger point and the, 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 the tipping point. And in, in all truth and reality, I believe it only takes one town or one community with sufficient influence in its, in its surrounding communities to achieve that domino effect. If you start thinking about this, I think it will become very clear to you. Yeah, man, those, that's actually great. Um, some of those ideas are really inspiring. I mean, this has been a real refreshing talk for me. It seems like finding guests that are willing to abandon money are few and far between. There's this mental block where they start to resort to calling me a communist or a socialist, which is stupid because those are still systems of authoritarian leadership and control by money. But that's the program response, so that's what you get. Uh, before we go, man, we definitely need yeah. to talk a little bit about uh, this big U.S. and Canada tour coming up in just a couple of weeks. Tell us what's going on there. You know, where can people get more information? How can people come out to support these ideas and keep these kind of things going? Well, um, thanks very much, Greg. Yeah, we we be leaving for the USA, arriving, um, doing my first presentation on the 14th of uh, July. That's at the Lightning in a Bottle um, annual festival in Southern California. Um, and then I go and uh, if you go onto my website, first of all, michaeltillinger.com, michaeltillinger.com, and there you'll see a button. Just click on it, and they'll take you to the 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 page and the blog spot with all the information of the tour, uh, with all the venues. We got all the uh, venues in the USA. Um, the, the major venue, uh, the major event I'm doing is um, uh, Contact in the Desert at Joshua Tree with uh, some of the biggest names in the sort of field of research from um, George Nuri will be there as well. Uh, nice. um, Jim Mars, Graham Hancock, uh, Stephen Greer, uh, David Wilcock, um, Giorgio Tsoukalos, the, the founder and presenter of Ancient Aliens, he's going to be there as well, and and some other amazing presenters. Uh, one of my favorite people that I've met at my first uh, visit to the USA, um, Celeste Yarnell, who is actually a, a, a Hollywood star who's, uh, who, who was in Star Trek many years ago, uh, and uh, she's going to be speaking there as well, and, and a host of... Um, um, William Henry and a host of, of amazing researchers. So check out Contact in the Desert um, and try and make it to that. I'll be doing three presentations there. Uh, so a lot of time to get a lot of this information across. And then we'll be following, we'll be doing the following cities. I'll just rattle them off, but sure, you'll see them sure. on my website. We'll be doing H Hawaii, uh, where I'm presenting to Nassim Haramein and his research team, all my research on the sound and the energy devices that I've discovered here. And that's going to blow their mind. I know once they see what we've got here, it's going to just, it's, it's a whole new paradigm shift that your brain does, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, so we do um, uh, Santa Barbara, um, San Francisco, Sacramento, Portland, um, Salt Lake City, um, Las Vegas, and then Contact in the Desert. Um, and then we go to Los Angeles, San Diego, um, Phoenix, um, Sedona, Boulder, and then down to Dallas and Austin, and we end up in Chattanooga, Tennessee, um, before we fly out to a tour of England for another month. So it's crazy. Very cool, man. And I'm definitely hoping to come out in San Diego and see you. Do you have a, a venue picked? Because it seems like on the website I looked at, there wasn't a, a venue listed for San Diego. Oh, yeah, no, we have a venue. It's You know, what I find fascinating is that, that a, a few of the um, – Freemason halls offering their, their halls up for my presentations. I find that fascinating. Yeah. Uh, and it, it just brings you actually, that, that opens up a whole new debate as to what the original intention of the Freemasons was. And I believe it is not necessarily as dark and, and sinister as many people would like to make it out to be. Um, so it's fascinating. So in, in San Diego, I'll be talking at the, 
at the Scottish Rite uh, Freemason Hall. Um, I don't know what the address is, but it'll be on the website uh, in the next day or two. All right. Very cool, man. Well, it's been awesome again. Thank you. Keep fighting the good fight. Hopefully we'll catch you on the tour, and we can talk about your new book maybe when you get back home. That'll be awesome. Yeah, my new book will be available as an ebook on my website, hopefully very, very soon. So, yeah, go out, go out and, and get the ebook. Um, 